Uh, what I do encourage you a little bit with God's word as we uh, get ready to get started, and, and hopefully that will help settle our hearts and minds for the great challenge before you of the quiz, uh, which Rob says is not going to be hard. And you believe him, don't you? That's all relative. I do. It's all relative. Like last, yes. Last year when you said you were going to take it out. So, Psalm 119 is where our church congregation is in our quiet time right now. And. Um, it was uh, Saturday, it was Sunday's reading. No, it was, uh, we read it Sunday. It was, no, it was Sunday, it was Saturday's reading. It was Saturday's reading. We started Psalm 119. Um, how blessed are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. How blessed are those who observe his testimonies, who seek him with all their heart. They also do no unrighteousness, they walk in his ways. You have ordained your precepts that we should keep them diligently. Oh, that my ways may be established to keep your statutes. Then I shall not be ashamed when I look upon all your commandments. I shall give thanks to you with uprightness of heart when I learn your righteous judgments. I shall keep your statutes. Do not forsake me utterly. I was kind of um, encouraged. I, I, if those of you who have been in the Psalms with us, Life always seems to kind of go along with where we're reading in God's Word. And we're, this last week we were doing the class here, and I'm reading, I'm thinking, wait, well, this is what we were talking about in class. Uh, but the thing that stood out to me was verse 2. He says, how blessed are those who observe his testimonies, who seek him with all their heart. What are we doing? What are we doing here? We're not here just trying to gain information. Uh, I, I'm still working on getting myself a, a little stuffed animal that's a hippo. And then I'll dress it up with like a fairy. And, and it's going to be the symbol, no hippo fairies allowed. Uh, hypocritical uh, Pharisees is the idea. Uh, they knew. They had information. Uh, but they didn't necessarily live it out. It didn't mean a whole lot to them. And, and, and he says, we seek him with our whole heart. And the way that we seek him with our whole heart is that we observe his testimonies. And observe isn't just look at. It's the same kind of observe we see in the Great Commission, where we're commanded to go and make disciples of all the nations, teaching them to observe, teaching them to obey all that he's commanded. It always comes back to that, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. When God shows us light, when he shows himself to us, we need to respond. It's not something we just tuck away and say, oh good, look at, look at me, I'm a theologian now. Be a theologian, but be a practical theologian in that you learn who God is and then you follow him. Uh, as you go through Psalm 119, I've seen it almost every day so far, there's that, oh God, your word is so great, and I'm going to follow it. I'm going to do what you say because I really do believe that. Uh, if it's just information, then... You're, you're more than welcome to leave. <laughs> because that's not what either Rob or I are, are really trying to do. We're not just passing on information. We're, we're wanting you to learn these things so that it makes a difference in your life. So that something happens and you walk in God's path and walk and follow after the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's pray. Lord, thank you for the greatness of your word to us. There is no way that we would know you apart from your word. And apart from the person of Jesus Christ. All creation declares your glory, and we see it, and we're in awe of it, and yet, Lord, it doesn't answer everything. It doesn't show us your great love, other than the fact that you've prepared a place for us. But, Lord, we, we understand your love because of what Jesus Christ has done. We understand who you are because we have seen the Lord Jesus Christ, not in the flesh, but we've seen him in your word. And so, Lord, as we continue to learn more about you as we study in your word. Lord, may it make a difference in our lives. May, it, may we have that world view that has you at the center of it all. That would make everything else make sense. So Lord, by your grace, by your spirit working in us, may we be those who faithfully and diligently seek after your word that we would hear it. And that we would be those who just as diligently follow after you
We are going to start with the names of God. You can find that page in your notebook. We're after the theism section. And, uh, this is where it really gets fun. We've been kind of going through some epistemology. I know it's more philosophical kind of stuff, but it lays the groundwork. And um, maybe a little. How are you doing with uh, Schaefer? Anybody reading Schaefer? No, I'm not reading Schaefer. Yeah. He's to the first two chapters. Yeah. And there was a whole thing that I got down to the first chapter and he said, just go through it and then because you come back to the again. Yeah. Sure. He, he's a wonderful thinker. Okay, uh, if you're all in your notes there. Um, so, the study of God's character rightly begins with the study of the names of God because in the Old Testament, especially in the Old Testament, and you have this in your notes, uh, names were seen not as titles, but as descriptions of the character or characteristic of that person. It's very true of God. And thus, the study of the divine names is fruitful. And uh, it's very interesting, once you kind of get a handle on these names, where they appear in what passages of Scripture. Very fascinating to me. So, um, insights into God's character. And as, as we learned, uh, two, two courses again, context, context. And you'll see where context comes into play here. Because some of these titles, which are God's name, are also used of pagan gods and other things as well. So the first one is El. Let me get this thing to work. Uh, the most general commonest name for God and gods, it literally means strength. Uh, turn in your Bibles to 2 Samuel. Um, no, yeah, 2 Samuel 5. I just want you to notice how often the Israelites put L in their children's names. One of the most common, uh, either a suffix or a prefix, that they would put in their name. So these are the names of David's um, children, his sons. Uh, so uh, 2 Samuel 5, uh, 15 and 50, 14, 15, and 16. And you just go through the list, not all of them, but there's a number that have L. L is part of the name, especially down in... Uh, Verse 15 to 16, Elishua, Elishama, Eliada, Eliphalep. Uh, all, those are all derivatives from the most common general name for God, which is El. And when we get to Yahweh, and you begin to realize how many names were given that you already know that have part of that word in it, you'll see that very, very common that uh, the people, God's people would use uh, different parts of his name to name their, their children. And so El, the most common name. So, but the one you would run into the most is Elohim, which literally means strong one, and it's simply the plural. It's the plural form of El. And it's found more than 2,500 times in the Old Testament. It is probably the most common name for God in the Old Testament. Elohim. And so anytime you hear Im on a uh, Hebrew word, that's the plural. Right? Im is, is the plural. And so... Uh, Elohim is uh, pretty common. And so, what's the significance of the plural? Um, the Trinity? Uh, mm -hmm. Suggests vastness or immensity. Uh, there are other Hebrew words which occur in a plural form. This is in your notes. Uh, like the word for seas and the word for heavens, they are always in the plural. And uh, the plural functions here to suggest an unlimited extent. And so the plural form of El or Elohim may suggest the vastness of God. Uh, a little bit what we're going to do is talk about some of the nuances of, of Hebrew language here. Because this is the language, for the most part, that God chose to reveal himself through his names. We only have a few names for God in the New Testament, um, but a lot in the Old Testament. So we're focusing more on the Hebrew here. Uh, it also may suggest intensity. At times, the Hebrew plural, just in use in grammar, Functions like our superlative. So we would say, um, if you use the plural form of El, Elohim, it would be the strongest one. So it, for, it functions as a superlative in the way that we would translate it. And then, of course, it may suggest plurality. And if that were true, as your notes say, it would allow for the Trinity. But that probably is not enough for us to stake out the doctrine of the Trinity. We'll find out much, much more convincing uh, evidence for the Trinity. But there are some other, uh, uh, let's look up some of these. Uh, this is context. And so here's Elohim. And let's just take them in order. Exodus 12, 12. 
and uh, look up some of these to see how they're used. So this is God's name, the most common one in the Old Testament, but it is used of entities other than God. Like these four examples we'll show you. So Exodus 12:12. 12, 12. Are you there, Karen? Could you read that? Yeah. So on that same night, I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn, both men and animals, and I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. Okay, so all the gods, small g, Elohim. Okay, and it is plural. It's the plural of God. So, but here it's not used of the, of the living God. It's used of the false gods of Egypt. Um, Psalm 8.5. This one's a little bit of a question mark. And if you want to put a question mark next to your notes, that would be appropriate to do so because not all Bible scholars go, are, are convinced of the... Uh, it would be interesting to see what the different translations have here on Psalm 8, 5. Psalm 8, 5. We'll start with 3, Psalm 8, 3, 4, and 5. So, uh, are you there, Amanda? Yeah. 8, 3, 4, and 5. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man that you take thought of him, and son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than God, and you crown him with glory and majesty. Okay, so um, you're reading from the NIV? Uh, NASB. NASB. Um, so it translates Elohim in verse 5. You have made him a little lower than Elohim. Oh, you have angels in your temple. Yeah. yeah. You have heavenly beings. What do you have? Angels. Angels, okay? So it's the word Elohim. So um, the context doesn't fit God. You, it's God has made them a little lower than the strong one. The, the, the strong one. The strong ones, plural. Uh, angels, I think, fits the context. But again, here's an example of Elohim that's not God, right? Mm -hmm. So whether you have angels or overnight or ones. Pardon me? In verse 5? Yeah. In verse uh, 5. Yeah. Yeah. Well, mine actually translates it God. Yeah, because it is God. Um, but again, the question mark. Yeah. Turn to Exodus 20, 23. The next one on your list there. Psalm 82.6, where it's used of men. Elohim, same word, context dictates. Psalm 82, uh, read the whole thing. Are you there, Jordan? Just, just read that psalm from verse 1 on. God stands in the congregation of the mighty. He judges among the gods. How long will you judge unjustly and accept the persons of the wicked? Defend the poor and fatherless. Do justice to the afflicted and the needy. Deliver the poor and the needy. Rid them of the hand of the wicked. They know not, neither will they understand. They walk on in darkness, all the foundations of the earth are out of course. I have said you are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High, but you shall die like men, and fall like one of the princes. Arise, O God, judge the earth, for you shall inherit all nations. Okay, verse 6. I said you are Elohim, and the context seems to indicate that he's talking to men. Okay, so here's an example of Elohim, which is used 2,500 times to translate God, but it's also God's angels, idols, men, and then the, the one that is used the most of is the one true God. Um, so, uh, but let me just give you an example, since I gave you some examples, turn to Genesis 1. First verse of the Bible, Genesis 1.1. 1, 1.
And just so you know, in the beginning, Elohim created the heavens. The earth was formless and void, the darkness was over the surface of the deep. The spirit of Elohim was moving over the surface of the water. And Elohim said, let there be light. Verse 4, and Elohim saw that the light was good. Verse 5, and Elohim called the light day. It's all Elohim, all the way through. So the most common name that God gives himself in in the Old Testament is Elohim. And you get it in the very first verse of the Bible. And it just continues on from there. Okay, well, what about the theological meaning of Elohim? Um, two that uh, the scholars point to mainly. God as transcendent, and uh, which is means above all, stresses his perfection and his role, uh, his role as creator of the cosmos, and then God is universal, stresses his deity over all peoples, all nations, and all tribes. So Elohim, um, theologically, uh, again, the plural probably vastness, intensity, um, and then connect the plural with the meanings of Elohim as we were, it, it would be very difficult 2,500 times to go through and try to nail down a real clear definition of Elohim because it's used in so many different ways. But these would be the, this is where you land, mostly above all, transcendent, and, uh, and his universal uh, reign as well. Um, so that's the most common one. Here's the second word that you would run into. Um, it means Lord or Master, Adonai. It may be used of men as a form of address, respect, like sir, as S-I-R, sir. It's used of pagan gods as well as the one true God. Again, context dictates what, what's used here. When used of God, though, it emphasizes his lordship, implying all people are to serve him. Um, turn to Genesis 15. It is the first occurrence of Adonai in the Bible, Genesis 15. Um, you get from what's in the Bible to the Elohim and whatever to like the concordance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What you do is if you uh, once you learn the the numbers, the Strong's numbers, mm -hmm. you can go into your concordance and uh, if you look up uh, Lord or God, you'll just you'll learn right away that uh, you know. Elohim is 430, the Strong's number 430 is 600. And then, but it, and, you know, and so, uh, and some some translations will have different typesets for the different some of the different right. names. Yeah, that's definitely true for Yahweh. Yeah. Um, so uh, Genesis 15:2. Uh, this is one of those interesting ones. That's a combination of two names for God. So uh, verse two, and Abram said, "O Lord God." What wilt thou give me since I'm childless and the heir of my house is? There's a, there's a form of El again, Eliezer of Damascus. Um, very common. You'll see El in a lot of Hebrew names, so it's, that picks it up from God, the strong one. And so, Lord God is uh, the first occurrence of Adonai. And it's the first word, Lord, the God is Elohim. So, that's actually Adonai Elohim. And it's spoken by Abram, or is Abraham. So, Adonai, very common word, and, and where Adonai really is interesting is when we get to the next one. Because it comes into our spelling of Yahweh, or Jehovah, um, depending on your text. Um, it is, this is the, the personal name of God. This is the covenant name of God. This is uh, God revealing himself you will, you will find Elohim and Adonai applied in a more general sense. But when we get to Yahweh, God narrows it down from the world, which is Elohim, the most common, Adonai, the, the second most common. We get to Yahweh, and it's used almost exclusively for God's people. God is the Elohim of the world. Elohim created everything. In the beginning, Elohim created the world. And he's Adonai over all peoples, um, that Lord-Master thing. But when you get to Yahweh, it, it's a very personal name. And um, uh, so many translations, uh, we talked about that, I think, in the first course, mm -hmm. and I named uh, five translations there, and there may be some other translations here, but it translates this as name, as Lord, L-O-R-D, all in caps. Often it's a different font in your Bible, so you can know when you're looking at the word Yahweh in the Hebrew. You, you don't even need to have a concordance, because it will be in different font, and it will be all in caps. 
It's the only name for God that is translated, at least in these five, five uh, versions, uh, all in caps. Okay? Does everybody Bible do that? Mm -hmm. Do all your Bibles do uh, all caps? For, mine, mine had all caps for the uh, for Adam I actually back here. Oh, did it? Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. The Lord. Yeah, the Lord of the Did it have Did it have a different set of caps? Mine just has God. Yeah, I gotta find find one. Yeah. So we got Yahweh. Uh, if you look at your notes, uh, um, um, yeah, in this next section there where it says uh, using all caps, when using a combination of the titles, Yahweh is always capitalized. For example, if the text would read Yahweh Elohim, the English text would read Yahweh Lord, all caps, God, Elohim. If it read Adonai Elohim, it would read Lord God. Notice it's all lowercase. At least after the, the first letter. And if I read Adonai Yahweh, it is rendered, interestingly enough, which is Lord Lord. Okay? Uh, it's, inter it's rendered Lord God, with God being the word that's all in caps, not the awkward Lord, and then Lord in all caps. So it, if you just kind of, you can almost know what the, the terms are. Uh, God's name occurs so, so often in the Old Testament. But you can kind of know where it is, and Yahweh is the one is the one that's distinctive. Um, yeah. Uh, so how do we come up with Jehovah? Adonai mixed with uh, Yahweh. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It, it's actually it's a it's a combination. It's because the the uh, if you turn to um, Exodus three fourteen. That's, that's where we're given this name. Exodus 3.14. And I'm guessing that most of your Bibles will have some, some special note here in Exodus 3.14 to talk about this. I am that I am. I am that I am. Does it, does it give you the letters? The, it, it's called the, yeah. the tetragrammaton. Tetragrammaton. Four consonants, all Hebrew words are based on, on you know, most of them are based on three consonant core. And um, so Hebrew is, a, is an interesting language in that it, it doesn't have vowels. It has 22 letters and they're all consonant. And um, uh, so the, the word for uh, Yahweh is, uh, well, it's these four letters. Do you, any of your Bibles tell you that in, mm -hmm. at Exodus 3.14? Yeah. Okay. It, it, so, so you can see where, where we, how we get... So if you put an A in here and an E over here, you've got Yahweh, right? And if you anglicize this, Y becomes a J, B becomes a W, and then you have, then you end up with Jehovah. So, yeah. so um, uh, scholars are pretty sure that this is the right name for God. We're not sure. In your notes there, it says that the Masoretes. Remember any, anybody discussion about the Masoretes? No, 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 just no <laughs> about Masoretes. <laughs> anyway, the Masoretes were, they were a, a, a sect of scribes, and um, they took it on themselves to pr preserve the purity of God's word. Mm -hmm. And what the Masoretes did was that they, they uh, assigned a numerical value, oh, yeah. and then so they would assign a numerical value to every letter, and then every text. So, because for all those years that the, the uh, Old Testament was, was uh, transmitted orally before it was written down, the, the way they would check themselves is they would actually. So there's a, a numerical value for the word Yahweh. All right, they would add up the, the numbers corresponding to letters, and then the same is true for the verse, and the same is true for the book. And so they could double check themselves to see how that they were totally being faithful to the, the original. Uh, translation by the adding up the numbers. So the Masoretes, that's, that's their contribution. But they're the ones um, who added the vowels because, as I said, Hebrew construction is always constructed around uh, consonants. And then they add things on the front end and add things on the back end. But uh, the actual pronunciation, um, even people in Israel today, they just agreed how to pronounce a lot of words. And if you were to see words in Israel, if you travel to, to Israel, you'll see they're, they're all just consonants in the, the Hebrew alphabet, and they, they just have agreed on what the vowel points are. And um, so the Masoretes, who, uh, they didn't want to uh, 
they didn't want to pronounce the name of Yahweh. It was too sacred to them. They actually would often, as your notes tell you there, they would, when they came to the word Yahweh in the text, they would substitute Adonai. Because the word Yahweh was too sacred to even say it. And so the YSWH, the Tetragrammaton, which it was, which which is what appears in scripture, they would they would say they would uh, they take the vowels from Adonai in the Hebrew, and so we've anglicized it and taken the vowels from Adonai, and that's how you get Jehovah. All right, it's a long, long version, but that's that's how we get Jehovah. But the, the name of God is Yahweh. That's pretty sure the scholars are that that's what it is. Does that make sense? No, no vowels in the original. All right, uh, they knew how to pronounce it, but so it's really kind of a guess for us. But uh, but the re the way that Yahweh became Jehovah was you take the anglicized version of these letters. The Y becomes a J, the, P becomes, the W becomes a P in English, and then these little letters, for Adonai, the vowels, for Adonai, and that's how we get to Ola. You have your E and your O. So it's not yeah. Oh, you're right, I have them all I'm backwards. Thank you. I have Joho. Okay. Anyway, Y, H, W, H. So Yahweh's. So um, if you're, you are in Exodus 3, 14 through 20, um, this is where God gives the name to Moses. So let's uh, let's read this section because this is this name is uh, well, it's cool. Um, so uh, let's start with verse 13 and go through 20. Uh, Nathan, yeah. uh, then Moses said to God, "Behold, I am going to the sons of Israel, and I will say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. Now they may say to me." What is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, I am has sent me to you. God furthermore said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial name to all generations. Go and gather the elders of Israel together and say to them, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, has appeared to me, saying, I am indeed concerned about you and what has been done to you in Egypt. So I said, I will bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt to the land of the Canaanite and the Hittite and the Amorite and the Perizzite, and the Hivite and the Jezubite to a land flowing with milk and honey. They will pay heed to what you say, and you will be with the elders of Israel. And you will, and you with the elders of Israel will come to the king of Egypt, and you will say to him, The Lord, the God of the Hebrews, has met with us, so now please let us go a three days journey to the wilderness, that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. But I know that the king of Egypt will not permit you to go, except under compulsion. So I will stretch out my hand, and I will strike Egypt with all my miracles, which I shall do in the midst of it. And after that, he will let you go. Okay, so what's the gist of that passage? Well, what, what's God promising the, the people in that passage? He's going to be their God. It's a free life from bondage. Right, he's going he's gonna to release them. But notice what it says in... Uh, of the memorial yeah. name to all generations. Verse 15. And God furthermore said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, notice the word Israel, E-L, the name for God, Israel, the Lord, the God of your fathers, Yahweh, the Elohim of your fathers, the Elohim of Abraham, the Elohim of Isaac, and the God Elohim of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. This is my memorial name to all generations. And so it starts out with the Lord, the Lord of your, the God of your fathers. And so it's that narrowing down to the, the, the uh, Israel, the nation of Israel. And we'll see how that plays out even more so. So in your notes, what does I am that I am mean? Which God uttered in response to Moses, Lord, I want to know you. So. Yes. There's a note that says that I am who I am. It also says down here it could read, I will be what I will be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is that, is 
it's what it is is the in the Hebrew, the YWH is a variant of the verb to be. So it's the copulative verb, the verb to be. And that's what we would call it in English. And so, you know, there's a lot of possibilities. You know, it's the word is for us, or will be, or was. So that's past, present, future, the word to be. Okay, and so it's a variant of that. And so there is some variation in the way that it's. Uh, but in terms of wrapping all that up, uh, I am that I am, I will be what I will be. Here's some possibilities, um, possible meanings of the phrase, I am that I am. God is eternally existent. He has always existed, always will exist, all right? I, I have no beginning, I have no end. I am, just, I just am, all right? Or God is unchangeable. You can see where you can get that out of the same, the same understanding. I am. I don't change, I just am. Uh, God is the cause of all. You start putting them together, and pretty soon you have, it just begins to, to speak to the, the character of God and what he's capable of. Only God has real existence. Everyone else is a created being, but God, I am. No beginning, no end. God has real existence. But the, uh, the last one is probably the most consistent view of scholars. God is now present and faithful. So Yahweh, God is now present, I am. And beyond that, though, we get kind of into the covenant uh, part of God. In other words, when God enters into some kind of an agreement, usually a unilateral covenant, he just commits himself to do something. There's some bilateral covenants where he commits if we do that. So there's two parties to that covenant. But most of God's covenants are unilateral covenants. And when God does that, he commits himself to a certain course of action. I will, and we'll talk about some of the, uh, those covenants tonight, but the God is now present, okay? We get that out of the I am, but God is faithful. And that's a key part of the covenant-keeping God, that God is faithful. Um, uh, I jumped ahead. In your notes, you have it there. I didn't bother putting this down again. Though all the above explanations are possible and can be verified as true of God from elsewhere in Scripture, the last one, as I said, best fits the context God is now present and faithful. The others are either too philosophical and speculative for the Hebrew mindset or foreign to the context. God's presence with Moses and the people, his faithfulness and promise fits the passage best. We're just looking at Exodus 3, 14 through 20. Okay? God is now present and faithful. Um, there's a problem, though, with something that God said to uh, Moses. If you look at Exodus 6.3, so just go over a couple of chapters from where you were. Um, it's, <laughs> when did this name first come into use? And that's the problem with the antiquity or the, the timing, if you will, of this name. So Exodus 6.3, um, start with verse 2. Uh, go ahead and read that mark. God also said to Moses, Uh -huh. So, we have Elohim spoke further to Moses and said to him, I am the Yahweh. And I appeared to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as God Almighty, which is El Shaddai. We'll get that to in a minute. But my name, Yahweh, I did not make myself known to them. Well, here we are in Exodus 6 3, but the problem is, is uh, we have instances of when he did make his name known to them. Uh, it, it states that by the name Yahweh, God had not made himself known to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but only as El Shaddai. Yet, if you go back to Genesis 15, 8, and a number of other places, uh, Abraham speaks to God and uses the term Yahweh. So what does it mean in, in Exodus 6, 3 when he says, well, I'll, I, I didn't make my name known before, but now I have. Um, Abraham addresses God specifically as Yahweh in Genesis 15, 8. And he said, Oh, Yahweh Elohim, how may I know that I shall possess it? So how can he say to Moses that I didn't reveal myself before in that name when he had? And so here's the solutions. Uh, you have this expand a little more in your notes. By my name, the Hebrew notion of name suggests not just a title to be pronounced, but the full expression of the character of the one who bears that name. 
Thus Abraham may have known the name Yahweh, but apparently did not understand fully the character of the person who went by that. He had yet to experience the, the fullness of the covenant aspect, the present and faithful aspect of Yahweh. Uh, another possible solution, Yahweh, as suggested above, um, suggests God's present faithfulness, particularly in times of oppression. The enslaved people of Israel would have understood this in a way. So the, in, in uh, Moses' time, their oppression, they would have understood this name of, Ab of God in a way that Abraham wouldn't have, had we not had the, the enslavement of Egypt. And then the last phrase in Exodus 6.3, make myself known. In Hebrew, the word know is not just cognitive awareness, but implies uh, intimate, personal, relational knowledge of the person known. So this aspect of faithfulness in times of oppression would be unknown to Abraham in the way in which God would now make himself known to Moses and Israel. So possible solutions to the problem where God says, well, I didn't make myself known as Yahweh before, but now I'm making it known to you, Moses, and the people of Israel. And these are possible solutions, just picking up on the different phrases in there, find my name, Yahweh, and make myself known. Um, the theological significance of the name Yahweh. Its meaning is present and faithful, but the significance, uh, imminent, which means near, something that's imminent is near as opposed to transcendent, which is uh, above all and beyond. So God is near and personal, and God, as I said earlier, is seen in a special relationship to Israel, the covenant people. We'll talk about covenant in a minute. Um, any questions about that so far? So we've covered Elohim, Adonai, and Yahweh. We're going to look at the compound forms of those. Okay, let's take a break. And we'll come back after. You guys have been studying too much. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'll just tell you, all these names will be on the test. So, and these aren't, these are not, you probably don't have to these anyway. So, compounds with the name L. L means strong. 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 Strength. Okay? So, um, El Roy, uh, literally the God of seeing. Turn to Genesis chapter 16. Let's just read about these. Right there. So, Genesis 15. Seven to fourteen, please. Now the angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water. Her being Hagar. Mm -hmm. okay. um, by a spring of water in the wilderness. By the spring of water on the way to Shur. He said, Hagar, Sarah's maid, where have you come from, and where are you going? And she said, I am fleeing from the presence of my mistress Sarai. Then the angel of the Lord said to her, Return to your mistress and submit yourself to her authority. Moreover, the angel of the Lord said to her, O oh, greatly multiply your descendants, so that you will be too many to count. The angel of the Lord said to her further, Behold, you are with child, and you will bear a son, and you shall call his name Ishmael, because the Lord has given heed to your affliction. He will be a wild donkey of a man. He will be against everyone, and everyone's hands will be against him, and he will live to the east of all his brothers. Then she called on the name of the Lord, who spoke to her, You are the God who sees. For she said, I have remained alive here after seeing him. Therefore the well was called Behold, it is between Kadesh and Berea. Okay, verse 13. She called the name of the Lord who spoke to her, Thou art the God who sees. In your notes there, that may mean either the God who sees implying a sovereign omniscience, or um, the second option, the God who allows himself to be seen. Is God the initiator or the one who receives? Suggesting his imminent willingness to let even the helpless come close to him. The title is first found in this story. Her response to the vision, I have seen and remained alive. And uh, probably indicates that God is the one who allows himself to be seen. I want you to notice, though, so, Ishmael, verse 11. You shall call his name Ishmael. All right? God hears. Whenever you see an L in, in the Hebrew name, it's it's a reference to God. The other most common, uh, usually a, a suffix, oops, how to do that? Just, as, just hit the top left, I think. Mm -hmm. Or move it off. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know if this 
tool. Just click it. Yeah. Click there you go. Okay. Um, uh, all of the, the names in scripture that end in A-H is a form of Yah. Isaiah, Jeremiah. Those are all names for God as well. So very, very common in Hebrew names to either have E-L or A-H in the name. And those are names for God. Very common. That the, and so here, here's a, a combination for with El Elroy, the God of seeing. And, and, and probably the God who allows himself to be seen. And the next one, El Elyon. Is that, is that, uh, you're not supposed to be able to see God. Right. It? So what exactly is yeah, in, no. in the story. Yeah, good no. question. Um, you know, does God allow himself? I think the idea of seeing is to be known. <laughs> perceiving. Yeah, perceiving to have, Get it. have a, you yes, know, okay. an encounter with God, if you will. You're right, he doesn't have a form, but uh, that he would, and that's that relational, very personal part of God that we see increasingly in the scriptures. Okay, El Elyon literally means the strongest strong one. El is strong one, and so Elyon is an intensive form of that. Often translated, the Most High God. Uh, first occurs, it's all right in the same section, so it's, uh, it's Genesis 14 down to verse 18. So if you're there in Genesis, a lot of these names occur right here in, in the accounts with Abraham. So um, this is in the story of uh, that mysterious character, yeah. Mel, right? Okay? Melchizedek. So um, let's read uh, 14, 18 through 22. Uh, actually, would you read that? 18 through 22. Genesis 14, 18 through 22. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be the Most High God, which hath delivered thine enemies into thy hand. And he gave him tithes of all. Through 22. Right? Yeah. And the king of Sodom said unto Abram, Give me the persons, and take the goods to thyself. And Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have lift up mine hand unto the Lord, the Most High God, the possessor of heaven and earth. Okay, so where is it? how many times does it occur there? Four times. So you don't run into it before, and then you run into it four times in a row. El Elyon. You know? And so in this instance, uh, most I got. And, uh, and then there's another reference in your notes. We won't go there. But in Psalm 89, 27, Elyon uh, is used prophetically of the Messiah. I'll look that up sometime. It'll be worth your time. Okay. The next one is probably the one people know the best out of this group is El Shaddai. The Almighty God. It comes from the Hebrew word for mountain. The word Shaddai is the Hebrew word for mountain. And it does suggest strength or durability. Uh, not, not, don't have to go very far. Genesis 17. First 20 verses. You want to read? Yeah, sure. 20 verses. 1 through 20. Yeah. And when Abram was 90 years old and 9, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the Almighty God. How should I? Walk before me and be thou perfect. And I will make my covenant between me and thee and will multiply thee exceedingly. And Abram fell on his face and God talked with him, saying, as for me, behold, my covenant is with thee, and thou shalt be a father of many nations. Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be Abraham. For a father of many nations have I made thee. And I will make thee exceeding fruitful, and I will make nations of thee, and kings shall come out of thee. And I will establish my covenant between me and thee, and thy seed after thee in their generations, for an everlasting covenant, to be a God unto thee, and to thy seed after thee. And I will give unto thee, and to thy seed after thee, the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan, 
for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. And God said unto Abraham, Thou shalt keep my covenant, therefore, thou and thy seed after thee in their generations. This is my covenant, which ye shall keep between me and you and thy Thanks, seed. Thanks, well, That just goes into this covenant of circumcision. But what it, why would it be important, given what uh, God says to Abram, now Abraham, in that section, that he would reveal himself for the first time as El Shaddai? But what's the essence of what God's promising there? All sufficient. I will multiply you exceedingly. You shall be the father of a multitude of nations. I will make nations of you, and kings shall come forth from you. El Shaddai, God Almighty. God is able to do that. God is able to do what would be impossible if he not El Shaddai, Almighty God. Great, great name for God. And. Uh, you know what's fun is when you get your uh, concordance out and you begin, you can kind of tell. If you run into Almighty God, it's almost always El Shaddai. There's a few exceptions, but generally the, the translators of our English Bibles stay pretty consistent on these. Um, so El Shaddai, the Almighty God. Um, the last one on this list is El Olam, the everlasting God. Um, you need to go to Genesis 21 on this one. And as your notes say, this is just before the test by God with Isaac on Mount Moriah. So, um, Genesis 21, 33. And I'll just read it. Abraham planted a tamarisk tree at Beersheba, and there he called on the name of the Lord, the everlasting God, El Elam. And uh, perhaps his revelation of God as the everlasting one, who must be powerful over death, that was the basis for... Um, his conviction, uh, remember, so uh, what do we learn from uh, kind of putting your notes together here? When you run to Hebrews 11, what do we learn that Abraham thought about God when God said, I want you to sacrifice your son, Isaac? He said, God is able to raise up a son from death. Right? God, God the everlasting one. And so uh, powerful over death was a basis for maybe Abraham's conviction that God could do that. Any questions about the L combinations? Uh, people sometimes mix the, the anglicized. They usually get Yahweh, they be Yahweh Yaira or Jehovah Jaira. You probably heard it both ways. <coughs> okay. um, so it's the next chapter in Genesis, Genesis chapter 20, 22. So Abraham has to, to sacrifice his son. He stretches out his knife to do it. The angel stops him. And then verse 13 uh, in uh, Genesis 22 says, Abraham raised his eyes and looked. Behold, behind him a ram caught in the thicket by his horns. Abraham went and took the ram, offered up a burnt offering in the place of his son. And Abraham called the name of that place Yahweh Yairah. As it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it will be provided. God will provide. What a powerful lesson for Abraham to learn. What a powerful lesson for us to, for, for, to learn. God provides the lamb to be the substitute for Isaac. Next one, Yahweh Nisi. The Lord is my banner. A little, a little more obscure. You have to jump over to Exodus 17 for this one. Exodus 17 and 15. Um, this is, uh, if you remember the story when Moses uh, defeats the Amalekites because he kept his arms lifted up during the battle. And so it's a military term which could either suggest the standard of an army that follows our pavilion of protection in the midst of battle. So um, the banner part would refer to the military banners. Uh, and so it's, again, God giving uh, uh, victory to his people. The Lord is my banner. He's the one who wins the battle for me. In Exodus 17, 15, Moses built an altar and named it, The Lord is my banner. Next, next verse, and he said, The Lord has sworn, the Lord will have war against Amalek from generation to generation. Okay. 
Next one on the list, Yahweh Shalom. Everybody recognizes the word Shalom. Judges, jump ahead to the book of Judges, chapter 6. So this is uh, from Gideon in Judges, down to verse 12. <clears throat> flip version of uh, Yahweh Nissi that uh, in terms of the one who wins the battle, this is this is kind of the flip version of that. Hey, why don't you read uh, 12 through 24. Judges 12, 12 through 24. Judges 6, 6. Okay, the angel of the Lord said to him, The Lord is with you, O valiant warrior. Then Gideon said to him, O my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? And what are all his miracles which our fathers told us about, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? And now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hands of Midian. The Lord looked at him and said, Go in, okay, go in this your strength and deliver Israel from the hand of Midian. Have I not sent you? He said to him, O Lord, how shall I deliver Israel? Behold, my family is the least in Manasseh, and I am the youngest in my father's house. But the Lord said to him, Surely I will be with you, and you shall defeat Midian as one man. So Gideon said to him, If now I have found favor in your sight, then show me a sign, uh, that is, you who speak with me. Please do not part, depart from here until I come back to you uh, and bring out my offering and lay it before you. And he said, I will remain with you until you return. Then Gideon went in and prepared a young goat and unleavened bread from an ephah of flour and put the meat in a basket and the broth in a pot and brought them out to him under the oak and presented them. The angel of God said to him, Take the meat and the unleavened bread and lay them on the, this rock and pour out the broth. And so he did. Then the angel of the Lord put out the end of his staff that was in his hand and touched the meat and the unleavened bread. The fire sprang up from the rock and consumed the meat and the unleavened bread. Then the angel of the Lord vanished from his sight. When Gideon saw that he was, oh, when Gideon saw that he was the angel of the Lord, he said, Alas, O Lord God. For now I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. The Lord said to him, Peace to you. Do not fear. You shall not die. Then Gideon built an altar there to the Lord and named it. The Lord is peace. To this day, it is still, it is still an Opa of the Abbey's rights. Good job. Yeah. yeah. So, um, given to Gideon in response to God accepting the sacrifice. God accepts the sacrifice, and it implies that God, and what's interesting is uh, Gideon thought that he didn't know if God was for him or against him. Uh, in the in the, the account before, Yahweh uh, Nisi, the Lord is my banner, God fought the battle for him. What's the problem that Gideon faces? He had to fight it himself. Yeah, I mean, he's facing an overwhelming army in, in the... Uh, the, the enemy that's all around him. And so, uh, in this case, God's going to be the one who brings about peace. So, whether you're in a battle and you need God to fight it, or you're facing something and you need God to give you peace, he reveals himself both ways. That he can either fight the battle for you, or he can pull you right out of that battle and be, be the one who gives you peace in the midst of it. Wonderful names of God. And, uh, and the connection with Yahweh, I, I can't stress that strong enough, that Yahweh is... It is the personal name of God. You will not run into Yahweh except almost always in a very, almost a relational context. It's remarkable that God would choose to reveal himself in a way that is uh, not distant and remote. You could do that with El Elyon, and you could do that with El, El Shaddai, but when you get down to these, the Yahweh uh, combinations, you get something much more close that you can grab onto. In the personal, and so the last one we have here is 
Yahweh Sabaoth, the Lord of hosts. Uh, 1 Samuel 1 3. Let's flip over a little bit. This is an interesting context where this one is. This is. Uh, It's just in the first account of uh, of Hannah and uh, Hannah. Notice the names here again. Akana, Hannah, Peninnah. What's the common suffix? A-H, Ah, from Yah, all all combinations of God's name. Um, Eli, E-L. Uh, very common, you see it all the time. So, First uh, Samuel one three. Um, it's a military term. Now, this man, Elkanah, would go up from his city yearly to worship and to sacrifice to the Lord of Hosts. There, it's where it occurs in Shiloh. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni, and Phineas were priests to the Lord there. Notice that the word Lord in your uh, translations. What what word is that? In verse three, the anniversary. You can tell from the. Is Yahweh, right? Mm-hmm. It's not in caps. It's all caps. It should be all in caps. Depending on your translation, of that so you, you you now know enough about these words that you can kind of just go, oh, wow, that's Elyon, and that's Yahweh, and, and begin to pick up some of the nuances here. Lord Almighty, Lord Most High. They, they each have their own kind of unique understanding, and it just makes the text, when you start to read, like, for instance, in the Psalms, oh boy, the Psalms are just rich, and, did you, and all these words for God are just all, all through the Psalms, and uh, you begin to see how God inspired David, the author of most of the Psalms, to use a variety of the names of God to express nuances about God's character in relationship to whatever it is that's on David's heart in the time of the Psalms. And it makes it so rich when you begin to realize that. It's not just all God. It's not just all Lord. But it's these, these subtle nuances that we pick up here. So, and, it, and it's significant in the book of Malachi that that's how yeah. that's the name God uses all the time. Okay. I, I mentioned to you that uh, before we get to the, the next page here, I wanted to do a, a, a short covenant name of God. I mentioned to you that Yahweh is God's covenant name. We're going to look at four of arguably the most important covenants in all of the Bible. Um, the Abrahamic covenant, the Mosaic covenant, the Davidic covenant, and the New Covenant. All right? Um, and we're not sure what all those are, but we'll cover all those. And I want you to notice what name of God is prominent in each one of those. So the first one is the Abrahamic covenant. That's in Genesis 12, 1. Genesis 12, 1. Now remember, in Genesis 12, um, Abram is, uh, he's a total pagan man. He's coming out of a pagan culture. He knows nothing. And uh, God's about to reveal himself to him. And uh, it's right in verse 1. The Abrahamic covenant is 12, 1, 2, and 3. Uh, probably one of the most important passages in the Old Testament. Uh, so if you're all there, Genesis, Genesis chapter 12, okay. first three verses. John, how would you read those, please? The Lord said to Abram, what, What's the word? Lord. Yahweh. Yahweh. Okay. Said, All in caps. To Abraham, leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Okay, in verse 4, so Abraham went forth as a Yahweh had spoken to him. Uh, so, remember, we, we were back in Exodus 6 and say, God said, I never revealed myself as Yahweh, but here he's having a conversation with Abram early on in Abram's history, and he is Yahweh here. Uh, we come into this blessing, the last line of verse 3. We are descendants of Abraham, not racially, but spiritually. We are the sons of Abraham. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. The, this, this series of blessings here in the Abrahamic covenant is key to pretty much the rest of the Bible. And so God reveals himself and speaks to him as Yahweh, the personal, close to you, 
faithful God. Okay, the next major covenant is the Mosaic Covenant. We looked at that a little bit before. Again, Exodus chapter 3. Mosaic. Exodus 3.14, where we first went into the, uh, the explanation of uh, what YHWH means. So if we just read 13, 14, and 15, uh, yeah, God uses several names for himself, but verse 13, then Moses said to God, okay, that's probably El Yon, plural, or El Yon, Behold, I am going to the sons of Israel and say, shall say to them, the God of your fathers, again, by Elohim, has sent me to you. Now they may say, what's his name? What shall I say to them? And Elohim said to Moses, Y-H-W-H. It's translated, I am who I am. Um, Thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, I am who has sent me to you. And God furthermore said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, the Yahweh, the God of your fathers, probably Elohim, 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 this is my name forever. This is my memorial name to all generations. But notice that the name to all generations is the name Yahweh. God, verse 16, God, go and gather the elders of Israel together and say to them, Yahweh, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob has appeared to me. I'm concerned about you. I'm going to get you out of Egypt. So, um, and that, that begins the Mosaic Covenant through Moses. So we have the Abrahamic Covenant, Yahweh. We had the Mosaic Covenant, where we had have the revelation of, of the Tetragrammaton, the YHWH, and then turn to um, 2 Samuel 7 5. This is the Davidic Covenant. There's several statements of each of these covenants, and I'm just picking the earlier ones. 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 5. David, to put, he's become king at this point, and. Um, he has it in his heart that he wants to build a house for God. And um, so uh, Nathan, the prophet, says, well, go ahead and do whatever you're thinking. And then that night, um, God appears to Nathan and, uh, in 2 Samuel 7, 4. And in verse 5, he you know, came about the same night, the word of the Lord, Yahweh, came to Nathan. In verse 5, go and say to my servant David, thus says the Yahweh, are you the one who should build me a house? And then he goes on and goes down through this and uh, uh, go down verse 12. When your days are complete, you lie down with your fathers. I will raise up a descendant after you who will come forth from you. I will establish his kingdom. He will build a house in my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will never take, verse 16, your house and your kingdom shall endure before me forever. Your throne shall be established forever. Words first spoken by Yahweh, the covenant-keeping God. Okay, so Abrahamic covenant, Mosaic covenant, the Davidic covenant, and then the one that affects us, Jeremiah thirty-one. This is the new covenant. This is quoted in Hebrews twice. But uh, this is where it first occurs. It's in Jeremiah chapter 31. Uh, 31, 31. It's 31, 31 through, uh, and then uh, down through 34. Jeremiah 31, 31. This is us. Verse 31. The old days are coming, declares Yahweh, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not like the covenant which I made with their fathers in the day I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, reference to the Mosaic covenant, my covenant which they broke, although I was a husband to them, declares Yahweh. But this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares Yahweh. I will put my law within them, and on their heart I will write it, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And they shall not teach, not teach again each man his neighbor and each man his brother, saying, Know Yahweh, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, declares Yahweh. For I will forgive their iniquity, and their sin I will remember no more. Quoted in Hebrews twice. 
So, uh, again, the, the primary name of God, Yahweh. The covenant name of God in each of those instances. So, that's why we refer to Yahweh. Uh, it, you know, all these other names of God reveal facets of God's character and the way that he interacts with mankind, but Yahweh probably is the prominent name in the whole group, mainly because of, of the connection to those important covenants in Scripture. So, uh, it's why, you know, we have Jehovah's Witnesses. Jehovah is obviously an anglicized name with vowels from Adonai and a little awkward, but uh, it is it probably is the most prominent name that God uh, reveals himself by. Okay, uh, a contrast between they're not there. Okay, contrast between uh, Elohim and Yahweh. Elohim is the most common name in scripture, more than 2,500 times. Yahweh probably the most important name for God in Scripture. So uh, just a contrast between the two. Yahweh, it is his personal name. And it is only used of the one true God. It is never used of gods or angels or men as Elohim is. We saw the examples where it's used of other entities besides the true God. Yahweh never occurs in any other context other than the one true God. It is his personal name. All right? Second uh, area of contrast. Uh, Yahweh stresses relation, nearness, imminence is the word here. It stresses his imminence or his closeness to people, his nearness to them. Whereas Elohim is more the, you know, the Most High God, God Almighty, uh, more of his transcendence uh, overall and somewhat distant in, in terms of that. Uh, Yahweh is used exclusively in relationship to Israel. But Elohim is the God of peoples, David peoples, Israelites, everybody. So Yahweh, again, much more personal, uh, Elohim more comprehensive. And um, the last one is the, the attributes that come into play. In Yahweh, we tend to see the attributes of uh, uh, God is, is a very personal God in that he, uh, you know, he carries his lambs. He has compassion. He has love for his people, where the abstract attributes of, of uh, speak more about power and uh, the, the vastness of God. Um, now, in this list, I'll, I'll have you know that some critics that question the um, authorship of the Pentateuch, Pentateuch is the first five books of the Bible, um, they say that they would point to the very thing that we've been studying, and they would say, well, because of the different names of God, that has to prove that it wasn't all written by Moses. The, the different names of God uh, is an indication that it actually has uh, various authorship. Um, because sometimes the name of God is Yahweh, and sometimes the name of God is Elohim and, and Adonai. So it must be different authors. And, uh, you know, that those are the critics that are the Pentateuch and, and Russell will address that when he gets to the uh, <laughs> next time. But probably the different names really are used to stress God's character. And it's not that it's written by different authors. It's, it's because God, being very, very precise, um, and, and I, I'm sure you probably remember this from our study of bibliology from uh, the first quarter, that Scripture is incredibly precise. God is the author of Scripture through the Holy Spirit. And if God wants to reveal his name as Yahweh in a certain context, then it has a reason for that, as opposed to El Shaddai or Elohim in another context. And so my encouragement to you is whatever your personal devotion time this week is, pick up on some of the clues for the names of God, refer back to some of the notes that you have here, and begin to let the, the various names of God that give fullness to his character and his dealing with people begin to enrich your own personal Bible study. Because you will find that God, I believe that's one of the reasons that he does it. He wants it to be a rich experience for us. And that we would uh, draw near to him through his name. Uh, uh, Yahweh. In the, the New Testament, um, we, we essentially only have two words for God. Theos, from which we get theology. It's the most common name for God. And kurios is the, the Greek word for Lord. And they don't, they don't carry nearly the significance nor the richness of meaning that the Old Testament names of God seem to have. I don't know why God chose to do it that way. I think the emphasis 
is that, you know, the, in the, if you think about it, uh, we talked about bibliology um, in terms of, you, you just all studied for this, bibliology is progressive revelation of God through the course of a book or through the course of a section, so that's bibliology. Well, in bibliology, as, as an approach to theology, what we have, you were to take Genesis and, and see how God, we, we saw a whole section of this was pretty much right in the middle of Genesis. There's about four of the, of the names of God were, you know, revealed progressively in there, where God is revealing himself more and more and more in the facets of his character to his people as we go through the Old Testament. By the time we get to the New Testament, God has revealed the fullness of his character. I, this is my, my theory. Revealed the fullness of his character through the difference of his names and the nuances of the names. And we focus more on the person of Jesus Christ uh, through the, 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 the time of the New Testament. And you'll see uh, when we get to Christology, uh, just the fullness of God's revelation through Jesus Christ. Again, hearkening back to a lot of these. Which would also relate to the covenant aspect of right. the new covenant and to the personal connection, that closeness yeah. through so, Jesus Christ. By so, the way, the, the critics were probably in the 1800s yeah. <laughs> yeah. with the rest of them. There was a whole bunch of them right there. <laughs> so, what are the four major covenants? There's, there's other ones. But Abrahamic. 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 Just give me the, the, the bare bones. What did the Abrahamic covenant promise? Blessings through Abraham. Abraham. Okay, so the next the next covenant was Mosaic covenant, and what was the essence of that covenant? Deliverance from Egypt. Deliverance from Egypt, and then, then we have the law through that as well. So the Mosaic covenant is both the deliverance from Egypt, but then this establishment of the Mosaic law. Okay, we didn't. I didn't take you to that place, but so the, so the Davidic covenant. What's the what's the essence of that covenant? There is ground being set up forever. Forever. And why is that important? Jesus comes because the promise was that the, that the Messiah would come from the line of David and be on the throne of David forever. All right, so there, there's that racial. We're actually going to do a, 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 a pretty in-depth study of the uh, virgin birth as it relates to the person of Jesus Christ. And there's a lot more controversy about that than we generally ever talk about at Christmas time. But uh, because of where the prophecy comes from, in Isaiah chapter 7. It's very interesting because it's very kind of confusing. If you read Isaiah 7, 14, where the prophecy, the prophecy of the virgin birth comes from, you just kind of scratch your head because it's made to a pagan uh, king and to convince him of God's power. And it seems, how does that get across to Jesus Christ? But we'll, we'll look at that. And then the last covenant, the new covenant, what, what's the essence of that? Two, two facets, really. Anybody remember? Anybody remember? Puts his law in our hearts. Okay, he, he writes, so it's no longer on stone tablets. It's on our hearts, so okay. So the difference is the law, how, how we comprehend God's will for our lives. Speaking of what? Essentially, what's that speaking of? Which person of the Holy Trinity? The Holy Spirit. Okay, the law written in our hearts is the work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one now who is, is personally, you talk about personal God, lives inside each one of us and, and takes God's truth and his law and presses it right on our heart individually. That's just amazing. I mean, the Old Testament people, that was never their experience. It was stone tablets in a box in the ark. It was a mediation through the priesthood, but no longer in the New Covenant. Mm -hmm. you know, no man will have to teach another man where is the Lord. The reason is because now the Holy Spirit. And so that whole New Covenant brings in the work of the Holy Spirit. Um, turn to Hebrews... Uh, it's an 8 10. But uh, let's go to 10. Hebrews 10 15. Okay. Hebrews 10 15. So this is a restatement of uh, Jeremiah 31 34. The other, it's, it's almost the exact same text in uh, Hebrews 8, verses 8 through 12. Um, but uh, Hebrews 10, verses 15. 16 and 17. And the Holy Spirit also bears witness to us for after saying, and here's a quote from Jeremiah, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says Yahweh. I will put my laws upon their heart. Okay, in the original context of Yahweh here, it's the Greek word kurios. And upon their mind I shall write them. And then he says, and their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. That's the second facet 
of the new covenant. First facet is essentially the ministry of the Holy Spirit, and that we are given the Holy Spirit and, and now know God. No, no, in the, I mean, when it says in the original covenant, that now no man has to teach another man about the Lord, it's not meant that we don't have teachers. It's clearly, I'm, just, I'm, I'm running ahead of myself, but when we get into the gifts of the Holy Spirit, we'll talk about the various gifts of the Holy Spirit, one of them is teachers. But uh, it's not that we don't need teachers, it's that because of the, the personal, very personal work of the Holy Spirit uh, in the heart of each believer, yeah. we can, I mean, you can sit down with your Bible and you can have a conversation with God. That's phenomenal. That was really not the experience of the Old Testament saint. David was very unusual in that he had such a, a close relationship with God's makes the, the Psalms so rich. But if you read most of the other characters of the Bible, it was not like that. And yet, because of the Holy Spirit writing the law in their hearts, and then of course the second facet, their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. Under the old covenant, how, how were sins dealt with? Sacrifice. Sacrifice. And did it remove them? No, it didn't remove them. But in the new covenant, they're removed. So the new covenant goes beyond the old covenant in, in every facet you can imagine. Not only is God distant, now he's personal in the Holy Spirit. Not, not only are our sins just covered over through a fairly complex and, and stinky mm -hmm. and sacrificial system, but uh, you know, just ask a hunter who's ever dressed out a, a deer. <laughs> it's not pretty. And I, you know, I think about a thousand bulls being slaughtered and burnt and when the, the temple of Solomon was dedicated. Yeah, what a mess. The flies. Oh, man. And you pour all the blood out on the ground. It doesn't go away. But uh, no more. That just covered now the sins I'll remember no more. So. Praise God that we live on this side of the cross. And uh, the, his, his personal, this faithful, this promise-keeping God who, who says, I am Yahweh. And when he makes a promise to us, he keeps that promise. And if that promise will go on into eternity forever. And God doesn't back away from his promises. And uh, so be encouraged as you read God's word this week. Uh, study guide number two, if you're, if you're going to stay on track, they're always due on Thursdays. And I kind of front-loaded them here so that as we get toward the end of this thing, um, you hopefully will have all of them done. You can, you can you get three that you don't have to do. But if you do the first seven, it will ease up your load. Although there's some profit in doing all of them because we're going to continue to cover the subject right through eschatology. So um, that's due on Thursday. Any questions? So. Uh, we got a minute or two here. Uh, anybody feel uh, that, uh, I haven't read this, but Pastor Russ did. Oh, what has God spoken to you, the last question number 20 on your quiz, that you're kind of getting a sense that you need to spend a little more time thinking, meditating, or praying to the Lord about whatever it might be. Anybody want to share what they wrote on question number 20? Go ahead. Um, I was struck by the um, man being made in God's uh, image uh, so that uh, God can communicate with him. Yes. So that God with man, and so that we can understand man, our God, and therefore love him. Yeah. And so it makes the whole picture complete. Yeah. Well, that seems uh, heavy, man. Yeah. I'm going to keep, te I'm gonna keep uh, teasing you here, but. Um, we have two sessions on anthropology, the study of man, and we will discuss in much more detail what it means that man is made in his image and how God communicated and what's the difference between body and spirit. And it, it has great implication for, guess what? The whole abortion question as to at what point does a fetus become a person and how does God communicate the, 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 when, at the moment, is it at the moment of conception or is it later, some point, that God communicates the soul to the fetus? And while you may think that you have that nailed down, uh, I'll just tell you that you're going to go away staring your head saying, you know what, I never thought of it that way, but I can see why there's good reason to have either the point of view that the soul at the moment of conception is a part of that one two-cell person, 
Or at some point later on, God communicates what we would call the soul of a person into this growing human being. And it has a lot of implication ethically, not just in terms of abortion, but in terms of some other issues as well. We will study that. And, but it starts with man meeting God's image. So that's part of the anthropology discussion that we will have later. Anyone else? Yes. Mine has a lot to do with the book we've been reading about just the. Yeah. And I don't think that way. And so to try to get my mind Nobody to think thinks that, that way. way. No, but just, <laughs> just to even think of the worldview that people have. And I think my mind has just been open so much to what our world thinks. And this is why they behave this way. And it just. It made me just like, my mind was just so full of like, oh, that's why this is this way, and that's why this is this way, and this is why I need to be praying for these people, and this is why I'm just like, I was kind of overwhelmed at some points, but it just, it makes me want to read the book again. Yeah. <laughs> but it, it just, that's what I've been yeah. pondering this whole week, yeah. it's just the vastness of everything. Yeah, good. Anyone else? Can you reflect on anything you wrote? No, I just, uh, Reflect on how it's important to, to know what we believe and why we believe it, but to also know how to communicate it um, to where um, through communicating it, we can make maybe make people think about those things to the point where the Holy Spirit can be able to um, interact and convict them yeah. you know, through through the way we live it, but also the way we can communicate it. And that this is this is really important yeah. you know, to yeah. be able to communicate. Yeah. Really important. So my encouragement to you, I'm hoping that each of you is in some way uh, interacting with God's Word on a daily basis, and uh, pick up on the, especially the word L-O-R-D in caps, and notice whenever you see that word, David uses, David uses all the names of God throughout the, the Psalms, it's a fascinating study to see, and often in the same verse, he uses three names of God, you see Elohim, you see Adonai, and you see Yahweh, very interesting to kind of pick up on the differences of those those terms, but notice that whenever you see Yahweh, clue in on that, God is saying, I am personal, and when I make a promise, you can take it to the bank, because I am faithful. I am with you right now, and when I make a promise, it is absolutely true. Count on it. And just because we're so powerful. John, would you close this in prayer? Dear God, we want to thank you so very much for opening up yourselves to us this evening. We ask that you be with us that uh, we will just open up ourselves to the words that uh, you want us to know will, will reach not just in our minds but into our hearts. We want to thank you for being the God 